Thank you so much, Britain, and thank you so much, Rupa, for providing these educational classes, which is win-win situation for both practitioners as well as laboratories like Immunosciences Lab and Cyrex. So today for this class, I prepared very, very special program. The first part of that is going to be about what I learned from recent 14 International Congress on Autoimmunity, which was held in Ljubljana in Slovenia. I'll share some of my experiences with you, and then I'll talk about what laboratory testing we should do for the detection of long COVID and for prevention of autoimmune diseases in the future. As you can see, about a month ago, this is my picture from participation in the 14th International Congress of Autoimmunity in Ljubljana, about 250 oral presentations, 500 posters, and more than 1,500 participants from all over the world. And I had the honor to present five different talks, which the research was conducted both at Immunosciences Lab, as well as at Cyrex Laboratories. The second part, I'm going to talk about the importance of correctly diagnose and detect long COVID, which includes SARS-CoV-2, Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes type 6, and autoimmune panel, DNA, ENA, double-stranded DNA rheumatoid factors, especially total immune complexes, actin and mitochondrial antibodies. So let's start with first presentation that I participated when I was in Ljubljana. This came to my attention because of the title, Autoantibodies and Precision Medicine. So as you can see here, pre precision medicine is its aim at individualized approach to prevention. So we are familiar with this. This is personalized medicine. So approach to prevention, diagnosis, and treatment by defining groups of individuals with similar characteristics. And then they emphasize the importance of autoantibodies. Autoantibodies are traditional biomarkers for autoimmune diseases and can contribute to, to I'm saying that personalized medicine, but precision medicine in many aspects, including identification of individual at risk, disease sub-phenotyping, and then prognosis and treatment and so forth. So this is a kind of um, personalized medicine. So we appreciate that. There were many, many presentations about the role of gut microbiome in autoimmune diseases. But what was new in this presentation that it was about the role of gut microbiome specifically in rheumatoid arthritis and whether or not fecal microbiota transplantation could help patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and the answer was yes. So also, I'll show you what is the mechanism that disturbed gut microbiota results in autoimmune disease such as rheumatoid arthritis. So very elegantly shown in here that impaired gut integrity caused by environmental factors. Food additives, for example. Then many, many new antigens are formed, breaking the tight junctions. The new antigens go through the, blood, the gut barriers, get into systemic circulation and molecules such as transglutaminase, which is involved in celiac disease, 
peptidyl arginine de deaminase, which comes from oral pathogens, many modified proteins, all that gets into the blood, plus autoreactive lymphocytes such as TH1 and TH17. Now, all of that in the case of rheumatoid arthritis get into the joints, causing inflammation or starting the fire in the joints, and then autoantibody production, autoreactive lymphocyte, these new molecules all together continuing the inflammation, and then after a few years results in full-blown rheumatoid arthritis, patient's blood, we can, in patient blood, we can detect rheumatoid factor, which is IgM anti-aggregated IgG, anti-CCP, citrulated antibody, and sometimes even anti-nuclear antibodies. So the beauty of this presentation was that, yes, they looked at microbiota transplantation and still they're going to do more research about this. So I mentioned anti-nuclear antibodies. Anti-nuclear antibodies, we know that it is one of the best screening for autoimmune disease. So nobody has any doubt about that. That is one of the best methods. However, in this presentation, the anti-nuclear antibody was measured in psychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia and depression. And in fact, they found that anti-nuclear antibody was significantly elevated in subgroup of patients with schizophrenia and depression. And the conclusion was that some psychiatric disorders could be autoimmune diseases. There was a lot about Asia syndrome. Autoimmune syndrome induced by adjuvant. What is adjuvant? All the additives they add to vaccines are adjuvants. Aluminum, mercury, oils, PEG or polyethylene glycol, phosphatidylcholine, and these all together called uh, adjuvants. But there are other adjuvants that unfortunately we put in the body of humans, such as silicon implants. We are injecting oils to some patients. And so therefore, about 10, 15 years ago, this, these disorders, group of disorders, were named as Asia, autoimmune syndrome induced by adjuvant. So adjuvant is the material. If we mix with an antigen, like with vaccine, and inject it together, the body is going to make 10 times antibodies in comparison without mixing it with adjuvant. But when we inject adjuvant to human beings, obviously it's going to activate the immune system and setting stage for autoimmune disease in the future. So that's my explanation about Asia. So in this particular case, one of my colleagues, Lucia, presented a 15 years old girl who was vaccinated with Gardasil. And Gardasil is nine valent. As you can see, it is stated that she experienced sudden onset of psychiotic symptoms. Her multiple infectious agents, antibody against them were positive, including Epstein Barr virus, HHV6, and also produced antibodies against myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, myelin basic protein, and GABA receptor. And based on these antibodies, she concluded that the patient probably is having or had autoimmune encephalitis, pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome, and chronic fatigue syndrome due to a single injection of vaccine, in this case, Gardasil. 
There were lots of presentations about side effects of vaccines. And this was about Sputnik vaccine, which was used in several South American countries. In this particular case, in one hospital, they had 28 different patients who developed some symptomatology of autoimmune disease. So when we, they further tested them, they found that 46% had neurological autoimmunity, 42% hematological autoimmune manifestation, 28% from thrombotic disease, very often, then 7% autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and similar percentage also rheumatological disorder, and finally 3.5% or one patient, some endocrine disorder. So ladies and gentlemen, class, what is the message in here? A group of individuals are exposed to the same vaccine, the same antigens, the same adjuvants, but those who develop autoimmune disease, they did not develop one kind of autoimmune disease, and they develop different kinds of autoimmune disease. And you may ask why, because our host factors playing significant role, plus our genes in development of autoimmune diseases. Another case of Asia syndrome was atypical Sjogren syndrome, which is accompanied by dry eyes. Many years ago, when we're, we were testing patients with silicon breast implant, we found then that all the laboratory test results plus their symptomatology did not fit the criteria by different institutions. Therefore, then we call that atypical autoimmune disease. So again, atypical Sjogren syndrome was presented due to silicon breast implant. Another case of due to injection of adjuvant autoimmunity, where in this case, they looked at 119 different implants and oil injections. And as you can see, they state that the results showed an increase in the levels of autoantibodies, thyroid stimulating hormone receptor, an increase in thyroid proxidase and thyroglobulin in some of these patients with silicon implant. And then furthermore, also they show that activation of TH1 and TH17 and these activated lymphocytes produced significant amount of prolactin. That's why as you see the word hyperprolactinemia in patients with silicon breast implant, and you are not going to find this in patients without silicone breast implant, and therefore this is another atypical autoimmune disease due to oil injection and silicone breast implant. There were several presentations about tattoos, but let's look at the first sentence. Tattoos are safe based on current evidence, but tattoo inks are currently minimally regulated for composition or purity. Now, if you dig in and you look at what is used in tattoos, there we go, here. Red, they use mercury in it. How could we say if they use mercury? For blue, they use cobalt and copper. For yellow, they use cadmium. Yes, they used also some vegetables, 
based pigments, but who says vegetables, injecting vegetables inside our skin is safe. And finally, please pay attention to this. Plastic based pigments. And so therefore, all of that is going to keep the immune system very busy. And maybe the immune system become overactivated. And this is one of the examples that I'm putting in here that environmental stimuli, such as those used in tattoos, can activate macrophages. And not only can activate macrophages, as you know that N2 are resolve the disease. They are the good guys. The M1 causing inflammation and fire in the body. So these materials used in tattoo can change M2 to M1, and that helps in disease progression. So that's the mechanism. PEG or polyethylene glycol as its major components of mRNA vaccine in order to stabilize uh, the uh, nanoparticles. So in this presentation, we based on the research we did at the immunosciences lab, we measured antibody against PEG to see whether or not PEG is an antigen, polyethylene glycol. And let me show you the results. We took polyethylene glycol of three different sizes, 5K, 20K, and 40K. And then, we measured antibodies against 90 different era taken from individuals before 2018. No SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. In 10% to 13%, we found antibody elevation against PEG. You may ask why? Because PEG is used in many medications and, and in many consumers' products. So we are exposed to PEG and daily basis. But in those who were in with mRNA vaccine, the percent of positivity went up for IgG in, for against 5K, 43%, in one case, 50%, 52%. So huge difference between vaccinated versus non-vaccinated. So PEG is an adjuvant. Furthermore, we took actually the vaccine component, which contains nanoparticles, PEG, and also phosphatidylcholine. Control 15% patient with COVID or uh, vaccinated, 51%. And finally, the most antigenic material that we found it is phosphatidylcholine. Yes, you treat patients orally with phosphatidylcholine. You are not injecting them with phosphatidylcholine. But in this case, we are adding phosphatidylcholine to all those other adjuvants plus mRNA, and we are injecting them. So therefore, phosphatidylcholine, 64%, and controls, 13%. So again, PEG is antigenic, and we should not use or inject that in the human body. Now I'm talking about nanoparticles, now microplastic, nanoplastic. This article was published a month ago in New England Journal of Medicine. Microplastic and nanoplastic are emerging as a potential risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Where is the evidence? Because they looked at carotid arteries, patients who had plaque, and they have a new methodology for microplastic and nanoplastic, and those who died from myocardial infarction or stroke had significantly very high levels of microplastic and nanoplastic in their arteries. And those who did not have the disease did not have this microplastic and nanoplastic in their arteries. 
Furthermore, an article in Environmental Science and Technology 2022, just look at the title, Common Single-Use Consumer Plastic Products Release Trillions of Sub-100 Nanometer Nano particles per liter into water during normal use, especially if we use boiled water or other hot materials in the plastic. The third article that I would like to share with you, with this new methodology, they found some kind of fluorescent nanoparticles present in Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And so therefore, the question I'm asking when we purchase Coca-Cola or Pepsi in a plastic bottle with a pH of 2.5, and I measured that in my laboratory, which is equals to vinegar, how many millions or trillions of these nanoparticles are in two or 300 cc of these drinks? And what is the consequence of drinking every day that? In here, they're telling us that nanoparticles are going to stay in digestive tract. But at the same time, also, they tell us they're going to cross the blood-brain barriers and disperse in the brain. So again, the question I'm asking, what happened to the brain function if there are so many nanoparticles and other particles in the brain? So that's why what I love in the International Congress in Europe, whenever I go to for seminars, they always use, they don't use paper, first of all, and all the liquid provided in the glass bottles. And so ladies and gentlemen, please do not recommend your patients to recycle plastic. Recycling is not important. You have to teach them not to use plastic at all. Otherwise, plastic nanoparticles act as adjuvant, activate the immune system, and help in the action of autoimmunity. Many times, practitioners like yourself order Array 11 by Cyrex which measure chemical antibodies, find the patients are having or making antibodies against vitamin A, phthalates, tetrabromobisphenol A, tetrachromobisphenol A. We ask where these antibodies are coming from. The antibodies are coming because these nanoparticles bind to human proteins, and then we make antibodies against human proteins as well as those nanoparticles. So please advise your patients not to use any plastic materials, even when they, if, if they want to drink cold water. There were lots of presentations about nutrition and how we can help immune system and how we can slow down aging by the use, use of the right nutrition. And you are familiar with that, so I'm not going to present a lot about that. So now we are going to the COVID-19 and post-COVID, which almost all day was devoted to this issue. So in this presentation from scientists from Germany, first of all, they say that about 5% of the patients with SARS-CoV-2 do not recover, and they develop long-lasting symptoms, which we call that long COVID. And NECFS, or myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, is one of the most disabling post-infectious syndrome. And there is evidence that treatment targeting autoantibodies, including removing the B cells and immune absorption, have efficacy in MECFS as well as in long COVID. Although they were to some degree successful by doing this, but I would like to go one step further. 
and talk to the class and by saying that this is not really a solution. Because if you do immune absorption, removing the antibodies, then three months later, the antibodies will be back. The best solution will be to find the triggers of long COVID. Is it Epstein Barr virus? Is it HHV6? Is it tattoo? Is it polyethylene glycol? By finding those triggers, and when you remove the triggers, the antibody by itself will go away because half life of IgG antibody is between 18 to 21 days. So, therefore, we would like in this class to understand the mechanisms involved in the induction of long COVID. So number one is persistence of virus, meaning in this case, SARS-CoV-2 or its mRNA, the remnants of the virus. Many studies have shown that either the virus or remnants of the virus stays in the gut, in the brain, and in many other parts of the body. Then that may cause reactivation of latent viruses such as EBV and HHV6. And super antigen activation, all these viruses have super antigens, can activate the immune system. Furthermore, disturbance in the gut microbiota is a major, major component of lung COVID. That's why I recommend to look at Array 2 and Array 22 by Cyrex Laboratories. Mitochondrial dysfunction, mitophagy, and oxidative damage, definitely mitochondria, is in the center of long COVID. And finally, multiple tissue damage and autoimmunity, including autoimmunity in the brain. If you want to read more, Please read this article that our group published in the journal Viruses last year. So persistent SARS-CoV-2 infection, EBV, HHV6, and other factors may contribute to inflammation and autoimmunity in long COVID. And based on these factors, we propose diagnostic strategies, such as measurements of IgG, IgM antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, EBV, HHV6, viral superantigens, gut microbiota, and biomarkers of autoimmunity to better understand and manage this multifactorial disorder that continue to affect millions of people in the world. And the last stati statistic that I read, about 70 million people in the world currently do suffer from long COVID. We presented also this talk antibody mediated response to SARS-CoV-2, EBV, HHV6, superantigens, active in A, under PIN's diagnosis of long COVID and NDCFS. So first we measured antibodies against this component of SARS-CoV-2. As you can see, it's named as super antigen like motif. So we measured antibody against that, and we found that IgG and IgM were highly elevated in long COVID in comparison to controls. Furthermore, because SARS-CoV-2 peptide is also cross-reacting with heat shock proteins, also we measured antibodies against heat shock proteins, heat shock protein 60, heat shock protein 90, and because those heat shock proteins also cross-react with endothelial cells and therefore are involved in many cardiovascular disorders. And these are some of the autoimmune disorders associated with heat shock protein 60 and 90 antibodies. So when we measured antibodies against heat shock protein 60 and 90, we found IgM antibody was significantly elevated in long COVID in comparison to controls with no long COVID. 
That will now take us to reactivation of latent viruses, such as Epstein-Barr virus or herpes type 4. As all of us, we get infected with EBV around age 2. And, and following that acute phase, the virus persists mainly in epithelial cells and B lymphocyte for the rest of afflicted person's life. Something happened, SARS-CoV-2 comes, other factors, tattoo, silicon breast implant, the viruses become activated. They express new antigens. We make antibody against them. Those antibody cross-react with human tissue, resulting in autoimmune diseases that you see most of them in this flower. The same thing applies to HHV6. So this is uh, uh, antibodies against EBV, higher, much higher IgM antibodies against EBV in long COVID in comparison to the controls. The same thing applies to human herpes type 6. Also, we get infected with that around age 2 to 3. The virus persists in variety of cells, including glial cells. And that's why so many neuroinflammatory and neuroautoimmune disorders are associated with herpes type 6. And again, please look at the flower, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MBCFS, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, encephalitis, epilepsy, thyroid autoimmunity, Yambara syndrome, and multiple sclerosis, and many other autoimmune diseases are associated with herpes type 6. Now, when we measured antibodies against human herpes type 6, all three antibodies, IgG, IgM, and IgA, were significantly elevated in long COVID patients versus healthy controls. HHV6 is a major, major contributor of long COVID and autoimmunity. When these viruses become activated, they release an enzyme called DUTPase. These DUTPases are viral enzymes expressed during lytic replication of a virus and act as some kind of receptors for antigen presenting cells. So DUTPases can activate NF kappa B, can activate the T cells, can affect the T cell function. And viral DUTPases cross the blood brain barriers resulting in neuroinflammation and neuroautoimmunity. And this is the reference, if you like, to read more about it. Journal JCI, 2022. So we measured antibodies against these EBV and HHV6 DOTPases, found that IgG, more IgM, and then IgA were elevated in long COVID patients, but not in healthy controls. So therefore it is important to measure that. Finally, in relation to autoimmunity, we measured, or we did, complete autoimmune panel on those 90 long COVID patients versus 90 healthy controls. And we found that ANA was positive in 8% of controls, but 33% of long COVID. ENA, 5% controls, 22% long COVID. Double-stranded DNA, only 1% in healthy control. 14% long COVID patients. Rheumatoid factor, 3% versus 12%. C1Q immune complex, 4% versus 18%. Actin antibody, 1% versus 11%. Mitochondrial antibody, 7% versus 13%. So you see the element of autoimmunity is very, very significant in patients with long COVID, and we have to do something about it so this patient will not develop full-blown autoimmune disease in the future. So this is the other presentation that we had because I mentioned that Long COVID patients develop autoimmunity, but also autoimmunity in the brain. And here the evidence that brain autoimmunity is strongly associated with long COVID. 
And we found, yes, patients with long COVID made antibodies against myelin basic protein, myelin other proteins like glycoprotein, synapsin, that's 100B, and many other neuron specific antigen, which is done at Cyrex laboratories under array 7X and array 20. So significant elevation. And here, just example of elevation in antibodies against blood brain barrier proteins in patients with long COVID versus healthy controls, IgG, IgM, and IgA, especially IgM and IgA are statistically very significant. The difference between the group is very significant. So now I would like to present to you very fast, only the test results of five different individuals which doctors from Rupa sent their blood for lung COVID. And you'll see that we found actually five different fingerprints of results. So this is case number one. that of course, SARS-CoV-2 antibody is very elevated. That's why the star. EBV, the five components. VCA IgG was very elevated. Very rarely we find VCA IgM. That only in the cases of mono, but also was elevated. Ebna IgM negative. So EBV plays a role. HHV6 IgG, look at high, how high it is. And finally, the only component of autoimmunity which was elevated moderately was active. So this is one patient. Second patient, SARS-CoV-2 elevation, EBV only, Ebna IgM, HHV6 IgM, and look at ANA, autoimmunity, 1 to 160, and with actin and with C1Q, so completely different from the first patient. The third patient, SARS-CoV-2 antibody moderately elevated, EBV, both VCA and EAD, very high, both HHV6 IgG and IgM, and this time ENA is elevated and borderline elevation, the rheumatoid factor, borderline elevation with C1Q. The next patient, very high SARS-CoV-2, Yes, EBV, VCA, an early antigen, no involvement of HHV6, elevated ENA, and very high rheumatoid factor. Very high rheumatoid factor and some elevation in C1Q. So again, completely different results. And then elevation in SARS-CoV-2, EBV completely negative, HHV6 is completely negative, ANA is positive, C1Q is positive. So if EBV is not involved, HHV6 is not involved, what is involved in long COVID in this patient? That's why, ladies and gentlemen, and the participants of the class, always you have to pay attention to the other factors, the host factors. I mentioned some of those under Asia syndrome, uh, some of them under uh, environmental triggers. So not everything is about EBV and HHV6, but EBV and HHV6 participates in about half of the patients with long COVID. How about treatment for some of these patients with elevation of EBV, HHV6, and uh, so forth. So number one, lifestyle modification. Next, zone two cardio program. Definitely gluten and dairy free diet. Lots of phytonutrients. And then 16 versus eight hours time restricted fasting. Far infrared sauna. 30 minutes at 140 degrees, three times 
a week. Mitochondrial support. There is a pro product called Mitochondrial Nutrient Multi, CoQ10, PQQ, repair and stabilize the membrane, phospholipids, essential fatty acid, antioxidants, nicotinamide, and methylene blue to support the immune system, especially the NK and T-Rex cells, vitamin C, quercetin, zinc, and acetylcysteine, vitamin D3, and especially for the latent virus, viral reactivation, EBV and HSV6. On top of all of that, high-dose vitamin, IV vitamin C, starting from 15 grams to 30, 45, and 60 grams. Vitamin A, elderberry, echinacea, astragalus, mushrooms for Treg and NK cells, glutathione, and neuroinflammation support, resveratrol and its derivative, flavonoids, and curcumin. These programs have been tested by several doctors that I know, and they looked at the titer of some of these antibodies significantly went down after six months. So in conclusion, I would like to recommend the use of these panels at the Immunosciences Lab, the autoimmune panel, which includes anti-nuclear antibody, ENA, double-stranded DNA, rheumatoid factor, immune complexes, acting mitochondrial antibodies, because this can help you to detect and prevent autoimmune diseases in the future. The second panel is about viral panel comprehensive. It includes EBV, includes cytomegalovirus, includes herpes one and herpes two, includes herpes type six, includes varicella zoster and rubiola or measles. And the other panel, which we call it autoimmune, viral trio panel because these three viruses have been involved in many autoimmune diseases, SARS-CoV-2, Epstein-Barr virus, and human herpes type 6. And finally, the panel that I presented to you extensively today, we call it long COVID panel, SARS-CoV-2, Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes type 6 plus complete autoimmune panel. With that, I would like to close and ask why use immunosciences laboratory? I mentioned throughout this class that our lab test described today will help to predict and prevent autoimmune diseases because antibodies appear in the blood from three months to 18 years before full development of full-blown autoimmune diseases. Our laboratory is certified by the College of American Pathologists. Only very small percentage, maybe 1% of the laboratories are certified by the College of American Pathologists. Our tests are verified by CAP and other institutions four times a year in a blind fashion and we get the score. And I can tell you that our score is 100%. Finally, I am always available to interpret the results for you. So thank you for your interest in our lab. May we do great things together in improving the health of those around us. God bless you. Thank you. Welcome to Root the Health, the best place to order, manage, and track results from over 30 different lab companies in one single place for free. It's going to take you under two minutes to sign up, and you can order any functional medicine lab for your client in under 30 seconds. Let me show you how it's done. So here's our beautiful interface. I'm typing in the name of my client, selecting the lab that I want to order for them, and hitting send. From there, Rupa and their amazing team handle the rest. They email the client, collect payment, and even offer an interest-free three-month payment plan. We've also built the world's largest library of information about chronic health conditions, the lab tests that can help you find the root cause, 
and the evidence-based interventions that you can use to help people heal from them. It's called the Ruba Health Magazine. There, we have in-depth articles about almost any health condition you can imagine. And we give you step-by-step -step protocols that other clinicians have used to help their clients heal and that are verified by evidence-based sources. You should totally check it out and it'll transform your practice. And we can't wait to see you. So make sure you sign up today at rupahealth.com.